All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Not Another Whiskey Podcast. Delighted to be joined by a special guest today, and that's not Nicholas Polacki. That is Mr. Brian Kinsman, malt master of William Grant and Sons, uh, Glenn Fiddick, and the recently launched Wild Moor, which we chatted about in the last episode. Brian and I have been hanging out a lot, kind of behind the curtains, doing some secret tastings for people uh, around Scotland, around the UK, and then we're obviously, we did the launch together. So Brian, welcome to the show again. This is the second time we've had you on, but always a pleasure to have you here. No, it's great. Great, great to get a second invite. Always suggest the first one wasn't too bad, so. Yeah, <laughs> that's how i feel every week when i come get back on the show so <laughs> on that note uh brian i have a question for you what unruly hell did you unleash at, at the distillery were you running some underground drug ring in order to be paired up with mitch bouchard to work again what's going on <laughs> i know i know we were, we were talking about all the different places we've we've done tastings over the years and i think last uh, last week Possibly was the most unusual. Middle of the Highlands, literally what twenty miles from civil, in fact fifty miles from civilization. Yeah. In the middle of driving rain, doesn't quite match up to the Ellie Hills or you know wherever else we've been. Liberty Paris, Island, Vegas, Paris. Yeah. <laughs> all the highlights. Yeah. London, yeah. Paris, New York, Rome, the middle of nowhere in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think that's. Probably we just need to tick off Rome, Brian, and then we've done all the major cities together. Um, but no, Brian, always a pleasure working with you, you know, and it's great to be involved with you on another project like this. And, you know, we've kind of, it's it's funny because we were chatting just before the show. We're like, all right, so what are we going to talk about on the show that we haven't chatted about on all these tastings already? But, um, you know, one of the questions that I love asking you when we do this together is, when when this this project when when Wildmore dropped on your desk, right? It's it's kind of interesting for you because you're looking after so many brands now within the William Grant and Sons portfolio. Was this exciting for you? How did you how did you go around starting it? Like, what was the first thing that came through your head? Yeah, it, it was exciting, and it, exciting partly because this is like a ten or fifteen year journey through old blends, ancient reserves, opportunities. Um, you know, we've 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 obviously got a brilliant legacy of stock in this business. You you both know that you both worked in the company. Our approach to keeping inventory and um, effectively building up a collection of malts and grains from over the decades is well known. Uh, and we've had a few different uh, projects over the years of um, well, release, releasing things, looking at ideas, seeing see what could be done. And while we came along as a and genuinely, wow, this is this is this is big. You know, you and I have talked about it to to create and release seven expressions in one hit. It's, it's a it's a big piece of work for the marketing guys, a big piece of work for myself and the team. Um, it's exciting. It's not. It's you're know, getting the chance to actually create a whole brand world and a whole liquid world in one go, and and sort of make it make it fit for the longer term. So everything we are launching today. I'm fully expecting to still be blending those those uh, flavour profiles in 10, 15, maybe not me personally, but 10, 15, 20 years' time. Wow. So what was the impetus behind this all? Like, obviously, you guys are, you know, knee-deep in, in, in the Wildmoor, for want of a better phrase. But basically, for, for, for people who are new to this brand, like, walk us through, like, exactly what it is that you're doing and, and why it's important and, and so different. So essentially, we're, we're curating uh, a range of age Mostly aged blends. There's an aged blended malt in there, but aged blends, um, and you know the the inspiration, the 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 thing that's really stimulating why we're making them, why we're making them taste the way they taste, is is where we live. It's the it's the it's the the sights, sounds, and sort of locations of Scotland. So as part of the how how do you how do you write a marketing brief? It was very much written by be inspired by the Highlands, be inspired by the West Coast, be inspired by um, uh, uh, um, a, a heather moor versus a, a, a the Highland forest, and almost almost use that as a visual interpretation of what the whiskey might taste like. I, I, I like working like that. I think it's I think it's a very 
open and um, you know, it's, it's almost like you can interpret it. Because you can stand in those locations and imagine if I was drinking a whiskey, what would it taste like because of where I'm standing? And then that's effectively how the brand world has been built um, so that each expression is representative of not a very, very specific place, but a, a, a vista, a, a part of Scotland, a part of um, you know, what all three of us know really well. Yeah, and I think it's interesting as well because if, for us, it, it, we brought it to life last week, right, when we were uh, up in uh, Allendale Estate, which is, for those that know Scotland, uh, in whiskey terms, Glenmorangie would have been our nearest distillery, so way up there by Tain, but more central uh, in that part of Scotland. And unbelievable just standing in you know those moments. We, we had a moment where we, we launched the whiskey to everyone that was there. And it was right after doing this hike with um, a gentleman called Aldo Kane, who's a very famous kind of explorer. Uh, and just being in that moment in the Highlands, surrounded by the the hills and having the, the burn running next to us was, was, was very cool. So, Brian, you know, you mentioned already that seven different expressions of wild moor. We've got three that are in the core range, one that's going to China and Taiwan, and then the other three are going to travel retail. I think for the purposes of, of, of today, let's chat about the core range a little bit here. Um, so let's start off with the 23-year-old, which is the wrong, youngest expression, uh, Dark Moorland. Now, how did you go about creating this? What was the what was the kind of idea here and the thinking behind this one? Yeah, so the, uh, and I suppose just for total transparency, because you know this and I like to be transparent, um, I decided not to do the hike. I stayed at the bottom of the hill to be inspired by the countryside and, <laughs> and wait and use to drink the whiskey when we got back. But it did look like an amazing hike. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't going to mention that you didn't do it, Brian. But, you know. No, I don't want people talking behind my back. So. It's, uh, but no, the 23-year-old, the um, it sits... Uh, the way I like to work, and I think a lot of people like to work, is to have a have an anchor point from a from a flavour perspective. So the 23 year old is absolutely the center of the Wild Moor flavor map. So it's trying to it's trying to take that very balanced approach to blended whiskey, but then add on layers of um so there's there's a lot of sherry wood layered on top because it's an all the rose sherry cast finish. So it's got a, a lovely balance of of relatively grain heavy vanilla, American oak sweetness blended with with um, some of the bigger, heavier malts, a tiny, tiny little hint of smoke. So the the smoke, actually, when we were in the outdoors, the smoke wasn't immediately obvious because, you know, everything else is going on. In the sample room, you, you get a bit more of the smoke. So it's it's there, but not obviously there. And then all wrapped up in a, a really relatively intense sherry weed finish. So you get a big hit of flavour, and then it gradually unfolds. You get that lovely, um, gentle sweetness. And, and as I say, Every other wild mood expression effectively moves from there. You know, so if you're going to take that as the centre of the the flavour map, how are you then going to change it and move in different directions? That's very cool. So on that note, obviously you guys got to experience uh, that expression of whiskey in the heartland of where where it was trying to be inspired by. Is is the goal then that people get to taste these whiskies in their own home and then feel like they want to make that journey to Scotland and try the same dram? in that location like that would be super cool i think that would that would make me want to go to scotland <laughs> i mean I, I think for me when i saw this and i saw the whole concept of wildmore it ticked a load of boxes with regards to that because i mean you know me nicholas i like being outdoors i like hiking paddleboarding cycling like whatever it is and i think i said this on the last episode to see a brand that wanted to encompass not only the nature and the, the the rugged aspect of Scotland, but also the adventure side of, of things kind of really ticked a load of boxes for me. And I think as well, when, you know, one of the things that Brian and I have been talking about a, ro- a lot recently is this kind of, um, I suppose, the way that blended whiskey is coming back onto the scene in quite a big way. You know, we're seeing some really cool brands out there, a lot of them that we've interviewed on the po- on, on, on the podcast already. Um and I, I think people are starting to to change their perception about how blends are are, are drunk and how they look and feel, you know. Uh, and and I, I think that's great because single malts are fantastic, but blended whiskey really needs a little bit more uh, PR, if you like, and positive uh, stories like this one with Wildmore. Yeah, I agree. And actually, um, 
I think I'm pretty sure we mentioned this last week, but Nicholas, uh, you, you'll know this. Single malt often tastes its absolute best when you're at the distillery. Yeah. That feeling of standing at the distillery, it's being distilled at and drinking it, is a, it's a very, it's emotional, isn't it? It's a very special thing. Yeah. And I think to be able to take a blend and almost create a home within a within a, a, a part of Scotland sort of makes sense. You know, it's like a bit of a homecoming for that particular blend. So I don't. I, I'm not claiming we're suddenly part of the Scottish Tourist Board and we're going to try and bring people to Scotland, <laughs> but, I, but I do think there is a. I think there's something in that about yeah. drinking it in its natural environment. It's, it's actually really quite special. I've had experiences in the, in the opposite side of that, where you know I've gone to say you know California or the south of France and I've picked up, I've drank wine, you know, like a beautiful wine at at the winery, and then I've come home with a couple of bottles of it and drank it at home and been massively underwhelmed. So I think to to have that experience where the first time you're ever going to drink Wildmoor is is going to be that you wow like you from everything that Mitch has has told me and I, apparently I do have samples coming so I'm looking forward and excited to get to taste some of these because I know it's not coming to the US market but to be able to taste some of those whiskies and then feel like holy hell that's the starting point imagine then getting to Scotland and having to be be outside and have that pinnacle moment of you're right it's not one distillery that you're trying to create that moment for it is the the area whether it's you know sitting at the Loch Lomond shoreside or up in the 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 the, the space side uh, you know the Cairn Gorms or something like that in the Highlands whatever it happens to be I think that's that's really inspiring and really cool yeah no, definitely definitely so let's uh, move away from the, the market signal, Brian, because you're not a marketeer. You're a whiskey no, maker. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so let's go back. You know, I think one of the interesting things about Wildmore is with William Grant's sons, obviously, Glenfiddich Balvenie is within the portfolio. None of that has been used within Wildmore because you have such excessive stocks that you mentioned earlier on. Um, Gervin is within the portfolio. That's one of the ones that's, that's mentioned um, within there. So how is it for you when you... You look at grain whiskey. How do you look at grain whiskey when it comes to, to making a whiskey versus just, you know, putting a single malt like uh, Glenfiddich together? Yeah, I I absolutely love grain whiskey. I think grain whiskey is, by by our own doing, as in our industry doing, is is hugely underrated. Um, we often we often don't even really like talking about it, which is a bit odd because the flavour is great. Um, it is the absolute heart of all blends, um, and blends are still by far the biggest volume for Scotch globally. Um, and I, I agree with you that, that that there's a bit of a bit of a resurgence of appreciating blends as not just another thing on the back bar, but you know they've got their own story to tell and amazing flavour profile. So, so gra- grain um, grain should be more celebrated, and being able to have that stock mainly of Gavin Green, but we've we've got other grains in, in the ancient reserves as well that we can play with that, that brings little nuances. Um, but having that consistent, beautifully sweet, accessible, tends to be quite vanilla forward because the grain is mostly in American oak. It's such a it's such a brilliant starting point to then create blends. Because effectively you've got this this beautiful base actually just drink it on its own. It tastes amazing. Uh, but then you just layer on little bits of flavour, little bits of flavour, and suddenly you can start to create something that's, you know, to use the old cliche, it's, it's greater than the sum of the parts, where the, the final blend is picking all those best bits out of the component whiskies, whether they're grains or malts. Um, so, yeah, the, the more we talk about grain and actually educate that it, it's, it's a very positive style of whisky, the, the, the better. Yeah, I agree. I'm a massive fan of grain. I, I'd say I've, I think I drink more grain whiskies now than single malt. For the first time, probably in twenty really? years. Yeah. Well. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. So I just I, I I I not that I prefer it. I think it's just I think it's so underrated, and I spent so long drinking nothing but good single malt, um, and 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 other good blend, but just great great green whiskey is game changing. Um. Do you, and then moving on in the range, obviously the the the, the initial expression is the twenty three year old. Where do we go from there then, guys? So in the core range, we, we move on to the 30. Um, 30 Rugged Coast, Mitch. I'm sometimes not great on the names. It is Rugged I'm, Coast, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. Rugged <laughs> Coast. I'm still thinking codes in terms of using the blending system. Uh, yeah, um, the 30 year old Rugged Coast blend, which is, which is, um, it is very much, it's a, it's a great one to, to, to move to because it's, 
it's probably the easiest to imagine the inspiration. So if you think of Dark Moorland, sort of makes sense, you know, where we were last week, right in the middle of Scotland, you know, you're standing by rivers and there's a lot of moss and everything. Suddenly a rugged coast, transport yourself. It doesn't really matter east or west. West is a bit more dramatic, but west coast, sea spray, salty air, um, pretty much always a little bit windy. That, that kind of whole vibrancy. Um, and that was definitely the the flavour inspiration for the 30 year old of, you know, emphasise the smoke a bit more, not medicinal smoke, more woody bonfire type smoke. Uh, again, uh, a sherry cast finish, although there's a sherry cast finish as well, so it still has the, the depth and intensity of flavour. Um, but it's it's just a little bit raw, is that not, is raw the right term? Yeah, a little bit more yeah. um, ex- exposed almost in terms of flavour. I would agree with that. That's when when I first went through them, I was kind of ex- it was interesting because I was expecting a more of a a smoothness from the thirty year old. But you're right, it had it had a lot more ruggedness from that um, from that that peated malt going in there. There was almost like um, the definite creaminess on the palate. Uh, it was almost like cream soda, and then the smoke. I think we talked about this at one point as well, Brian. It was kind of like when you walk out of a house and someone has got got a chimney burning in the background. It was that kind of smoke. So it's just there, not full on Isla uh, medicinal TCP, but just like that that bonfire wafting in the background smoke. Um, and then sure. talking about you know talking about the other thirty rolled you have as well um, within Wildmoor tropical coast. You got to play about with rum casks again. You love a bit of rum cask, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> are, you rum, rum are, you, are you a rum drinker, Brian? I. I wouldn't call myself a rum drinker. I, I'm a rum appreciator. I, I, I like the I like the flavours of rum. I like the fact that there's there's top notes in rum that you you rarely get in whiskey. Yeah. Um, you, so occasionally you'll see it. You'll see those really super juicy fruit ester notes come through in Scotch, um, but they're pretty much always there in rum. And I think that that's an interesting contrast. And we we've taken the same view with these rum casters. We do. For all rum cast really within William Grant and Sons, which is try and um, control the quality of them ourselves. So, so we are our own rum bodega, creating rum casks, doing the the finishing in Scotland, um, so we get this really nice, consistent um, uh, finishing cask, rather than you know some of the casks coming out of the Caribbean, just because of the the, the climate there and the and the approach to cask management, and and then the transport time to Scotland is sometimes the quality can be a little bit. Um, uh, variable, so it's, it's it's worked really well here. Where we've got that that um, contrast of the all of those with sherry cask goes really deep, and really it's about mouthfeel and and texture. Whereas the rum cask is much more about vibrancy and and zestiness and brings out the the, the like those notes I'm saying earlier the the, the juicy fruit type notes, which I, I think works. It's a nice contrast. Very nice indeed. You might not work in marketing, but there's a job for you in PR of how diplomatic you were talking about the crap casks coming at the Caribbean. <laughs> well, I never said that. I'm only I, never said that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have tried some of these firsthand, having spent time in the rum rum industry as well. But like, I know exactly what you mean. You get some of those kind of funky notes that that just it's, you know, and, and that's even when we got to work on. I remember launching. Uh, I think. Of any fourteen Caribbean rum cask was the first time I ever heard of this. It's Caribbean, Nicholas. It's Caribbean. Stop being American. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness, this is so bad, isn't it? Caribbean. Uh, So the the Caribbean rum cask, though, for fourteen year old, that was the first time. Was was that actually the first time that that William Grant and Sons had had started to basically create their own rum styles in order to season the wood themselves? Uh, No, it it started with. um, what would have been Havana Reserve back in the day, so the, the Glenfiddich 21. So Grand, Grand Reserve, as known today, yep. when we launched that as Havana Reserve back in 2003-ish. Um, that, and, the, and the exact reason for that was was because we got casks, we really liked them, and we simply couldn't get any more because getting casks out of Cuba at the time was, was vir- not, vir- not impossible, but virtually impossible, and certainly getting hundreds that we were looking for wasn't wasn't practical so we but but getting rum out was was relatively straightforward so we so we brought the rum to scotland and did our own um casks in, in duff down and, and it just gives it just gives you that level of control where yeah. you feed in the quality wood you want you get the rum seasoning period you want you then um 
uh, empty it according to your own emptying program. You're not dealing with you know twelve weeks in transit um, across the Atlantic and so on. So it just it just adds a, an element of um, consistency. I remember we were doing uh, we used to do the deconstruction with the uh, Glenferic Twenty One and you used to send the rum over to us and that was an absolute nightmare because you know people if they were just starting their whiskey journey they'd be like well, so where do you throw the rum into the whiskey how does that and it was just like ah oh, this isn't working at all <laughs> I, had to, I had to stop tasting people on it because they kept asking where they could buy the rum <laughs> like yeah, what are we doing? yeah what are we doing here. <laughs> but there is, there is. I know we're kind of digging into rum a little bit here, but you do. There is different styles of rum, isn't there? Correct me if I'm wrong here, Brian. That you use for Balvenie Glenfiddich. Is that the same with uh, Wildmoor as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we're using a, a lighter style rum for Wildmoor. Um, probably, probably a little bit cleaner. Um, still got those top notes, uh, but not, not as intense a golden rum. Uh, and and yeah, you know, just it, it doesn't make a huge difference because the fundamentally is that you know we've talked so many times the oak is the thing that's driving it, but it's just those esters that you're going to really drive into the wood that some of them are then either going to oxidise or come come back out when you then put the whiskey in. So yeah, we we like to keep we like to keep them all a bit different and it just it has a differentiation. Um, and then of course without coming to some entirely wrong conversation, one of the single biggest questions we always got asked was. How, where, what do you do with the rum afterwards? And now we've got discarded banana peel rum, so we we finally actually do have a product where people can try it, and, you, and it's beautiful because it's so unusually woody for rum mm. in terms of it's been through cast multiple times, and you get that really deep intensity, and then over the with the banana, um, beautiful drink. That's cool. I didn't realise it was being used for that because I I still always talk about the fact that it was it was sold on to a rum broker, but that's not the case anymore. Very yeah, cool. that, that's it's the Balvenie 14 finishing rum that we use primarily for um, banana peel rum. Wow. Yeah, there you go. All right, so moving back to to Wildmoor, um, the final expression within the range goes up to a 40 year old. Now, when you're working with 40 year old whiskies in a blend, is that is that quite nerve wracking for you, Brian? Or you've done it so many times now, you're just like, ah, yes, yeah, it's easy. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's yeah. You've got to be respectful, haven't you? These are super aged whiskies, and some of them obviously are older than forty. Just they have to be. Even you're not going to have everything bang on forty. So you've got some pretty old whiskey there. Um, the the nice thing is, I've I've been with that whiskey for fifteen or twenty years of its life. So I've 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 say watched them go through some of our aged Grant's blends. The whiskey's gone back into warehouse sampling them you know every few years uh, being very aware of what's there and, and what the flavor profiles are so so when you actually get a chance to bring it into a blend you, you know there's a familiarity with what's there and how it, what might work um, and then at 40 year old the, the, back to the grain the, the grain is so deep in flavor and then you add you had malts that are big and intense on this one we do a px and um, cast finished, uh, just a little bit extra sweetness, and it's uh, you. You're, I'm sure you're saying a second what you think about it. And for me, it's just pure indulgence. It's such a beautifully indulgent old whiskey, but not not overpowering. You know, yeah. it's it, it just feels like it's got lots and lots of layers of flavour, but actually um, still still very very drinkable. If that's a not too crude a phrase. Yeah, I mean, for me, this just this has got such a big mouthfeel. It just goes on and on and on when you finish it. Um, on the nose, beeswax was one of the ones that came out. Uh, really kind of woody, obviously not over overly woody, but you get that almost walking into a Dunnage warehouse kind of aroma with the 40-year-old. Um, but yeah, incredible dram, Brian. Really what, cool. What's the 40 called? Black Mountain. Black Mountain. I jumped in there quickly for Brian. You see oh, that? You, <laughs> you see that look of nervousness on my face. <laughs> By that, what's it called? It's like C one four three five six nine eight. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Was this a, a project, Brian, that had to be kept top secret? Was there a was there a code name at one point? Can you remember? Uh, can't remember. If there, there must have been a code name. I can't remember what it was. But uh, yeah, I mean we we. So I said at the start, it was 10 to 15 years, not on this specific project, but on that evolution of creating old blends and trying different things. But certainly a good two or three years of of um, pulling it together. And obviously with a seven expressions, it's a lot of work for the distillery as well. Yeah. And 
uh, when you get to the top end, you're not you're not some some of the whiskies that go into the forty year old are not necessarily full casts. Yeah. So they're, they're it's quite a it's quite an intricate blending operation of doing it in the sample room, getting exact percentages, really in that distillery, getting it made up in relatively small batches back into sherry butt. So it's been a it's, it's been a really fun project, but one that in the early days when you're getting the distillery to work in it, you can't actually explain why you're suddenly interested in moving these older whiskies around. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so it's all getting done just, just with codes and names that don't really make sense. Yeah. And then gradually it all starts to fall together and uh, yeah, we can talk about it and it's it's going to go for a bottling. And, and now, it's... sorry, I was just going to ask on, on top of that. So and you, you're you saying that this is a brand, I guess, that's going to stay around for the next 10, 20, 30 years. This is a sustainable, highly aged, super rare blend. I think this is incredible. Like this... The, what a, I mean, what a massive, I mean, project, like just a, a massive undertaking from soup to nuts to, to take on that and then be able to forecast out the liquid needs and everything else. So, I mean, that's all hands on deck to, I mean, that it literally is like creating grants out of thin air and being like, right, this, this is our new brand. This is so cool. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's the key is um, you've got to get flavour profiles at work they all go together like a jigsaw puzzle. But then you also say, can we still make that in five years' time? Can we still make that in 10 years' time and be able to commit to the business? Say, absolutely. We've got recipes here that are robust. We can look at all the stock, you know, from 40 all the way back to maybe, let's say, 10, 12 years old and say, yeah, we, we've got the we've got the inventory coming through and we can start to deliberately hold cast back to maintain this for as long as we need to. Incredible. And what on that, on that note, Brian, I mean, Obviously, right now, I don't think there's any brand plans that that are in place to to create any other expressions of Wild More. Seven's kind of enough to launch this week, you know. Um, <laughs> but what's next week look like? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> have you have you got any ideas in your head as to how you'd like to see the liquid progress? Yeah, definitely. There's things we tried. Um, I mean. I don't think it'd be any secret to say we could we could clearly go older if we wanted. Um, if there's a desire to go to the next notch of age, um, I'm confident we could we could do that. I'm not saying we will. Um, the, the 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 way the flavour works, we've gone quite heavy on on sherry wood through most of the range. So actually, there's an there's an enormous area to play in of American oak and be led much more in that in that lighter style, which you know, I could see that coming at some point. At some point, in terms of the almost the yin and yang of, of flavour. So yeah, there's, there's there's an enormous there's an enormous playing field. It's going to be about what what have we got the capacity to do and what do we want to do from a brand perspective. And I, I don't know the answer to. I know what we've, we've got the capacity to do. But I don't know what the desire is for the future at the moment. And then and then of course then you need to find another location in Scotland to be inspired by, like Sucky Hall Street at two in the morning on a Friday. <laughs> absolutely that's uh that's wild something else mate. Uh, that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the that's the kebab sauce finish that you'll be working on for sure brian right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. so brian what's next is it uh where are you off to i know you've got another launch to do soon uh, yeah off to china next week or well this week on saturday um doing uh another level of engagement there um and then Taiwan later in the year, I think in two or three months' time. Uh, just one of the same. Well, Busy boy. Yeah. Absolutely. Thankfully, there's nothing else going on. So, <laughs> <laughs> Life is quiet in the Glenfiddich front. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> just got, got that other little brand to deal with. Exactly. It's the yeah, biggest exactly. single malt Scotch whiskey in the world, you know. Yeah, exactly. Takes care of itself <laughs> these days. Takes care of itself. <laughs> yeah, I wish it did. Uh, indeed, indeed. <laughs> Well, look, Brian, thanks very much for coming on the show. This has been a blast, a real education for, for myself specifically. Obviously, Mitch is real hands-on in this as well. Gents, it's, it's congratulations. I think you've done a wonderful job on it. I can't wait to try the liquid. And thanks for coming on Not Another Whiskey Podcast for the second time. Good. Thanks for having me here. Right. Great to see you, Brian. I'll, uh, I'll see you soon, no doubt, chatting about Wildmore again. Yeah, I know. 
somewhere <laughs> even more exotic, hopefully. For those of you that can't see that, Brian just took a massive slug of whiskey <laughs> at the thought of spending more time in Mitch. So there you go. <laughs> I've, ne I've cool. never seen somebody slam a bottle like that before. Well done, Brian. <laughs> Joking aside, guys, thanks so much. That was a blast. Thank you.